Hey, everybody, this is RJ Hively with the JW5 podcast. Today, I am on with Sean Munoz. Sean, I greatly appreciate your time today on a Sunday, and I appreciate you getting me in before the Bears game. So let's get that out of the way and go Bears win and we're in. But uh, I'd love to open it up, allow you to have the floor, just kind of introduce yourself and what you do with work, as well as what you do with coaching. All right. First of all, thank you, RJ, and, and no problem on a Sunday morning, uh, just prepping for the Bears game here. So, again, my name is Sean Munoz. Uh, I'm a uh, RVP Regional Vice President for Tanium uh, in the tech sector, Silicon Valley, and I'm also a coach at Diamond Club for the 11-year-old uh, 11U team. Awesome. Uh, who are the Bears playing today? Packers, correct? They do. They do. Ooh. Big rivalry. Oh, I can't wait. I'll definitely be there watching that one. Um, so let's start out. Um, Business wise, here and then we'll hop into the uh, the coaching aspect. Um, when were you first introduced into, into mental performance training, um, and, and how is it crucial for you to be successful in the role that you play? So thinking about that one a little bit, mental performance training. Uh, you know, going through high school, college, playing ball. I don't remember doing anything similar to this, and I don't think the first time I actually ran into it was you get into to the business world and you start to hear Stephen Covey's. Uh, highly effective habits and you're given books and, and that was really the first time that it had been brought to my attention that this was an actual thing awesome um and, and for you i i know you're extremely successful not only on the business side but also the coaching side uh and for me personally someone that i look up to on the family side of things and something that i envy and, and hope to strive for one day but why is a an elite mindset crucial for you to have success um let's start out in the business world uh, I think for a couple of reasons, I think, I think first and foremost, we're going to run into different challenges as we grow. Uh, and so an elite mindset, you know, really the, the different challenges you're going to face out there, uh, you need to know how to handle them. There's a lot of different personalities, a lot of different emotions, a lot of maybe career changes that, that you're going to go through. And you decide at one point in your career, you want to, to make a change or you want to strive to achieve the next level. You need to understand how to get there. You need to understand how to break that down into these smaller pieces that you can accomplish because just setting yourself up for a big goal of, I want to be the CEO someday. And if you're not there in two years, which you're probably not going to be depending on your level, um, you're setting yourself up for failure. And so for you to be able to get there, you need to have an elite mindset of what it takes to get there and the resilience when it doesn't happen, maybe in the time frame that you've set aside. Awesome. I love the word resilience on that because throughout life, um, especially in the sports world where, where most of my experience comes from on this, you're going to fail on a daily basis um, and you're going to have to understand how to fail and understand how that creates motivation and be resilient to that as well. Um, what would you say your, your probably top three habits are um, in, in keeping that elite mindset? I think uh, inner motivation is, is big. So I, I break kind of life down into, into four to three or four different buckets, depending on what you're talking about professionally or, or just with uh, sports, uh, really emotionally, physically, spiritually. And then if it's professionally, you're throwing financially in there too, to, to some extent. But I think the biggest thing is really number one, the inner motivation of, of what helps you kind of stay on top of things. Number one for me is physical. I think, knowing that I get up every day and work out, it kind of clears out the emotional, spiritual, or, or maybe it adds to in the sense of if I want to go run in the mountains, like it all kind of comes together, but it helps clear out the emotional aspect and, and gives me a, a level playing field of what I think I need to be at. Um, you know, so for me, staying strong, staying healthy is one of the biggest things, number one. Number two is uh, really the sleep, the rest, the, the meditation that I do. Just that consistency to make sure you wake up and, and you energize your body to the best level you can so that you are prepared and ready for the next day. Uh, and then I think number three, probably just uh, goals. And, and, but as, as kind of your first question, goals with that self-awareness of what's the reality of what I'm really trying to achieve and how do I get there and what are the things that are motivating me? 
No, that, that's perfect. And in one of my teachings, we talk about uh, telescope goals and microscope goals, right? So when you want to be the CEO in two years, that's a telescope goal, right? That, that's down the line. Perfect. Boom. We look into the future. Now we break them down into microscope goals all the way down to a weekly basis, daily basis, almost even hourly basis if you want to get very specific with it. And those are going to help you lead into your your telescope goals on that. Because, if again, like you said earlier, if we're only focused on the CEO part of that, how are we going to get there? Right. We don't have a roadmap or anything like that. So the, the self-discipline and, and the inner motivation aspect of that comes through all of those and we break it down so that can lead us and keep us on the straight path through. But one thing I love that you said is the workout aspect. Right. I had my routine with baseball. It was very, very good. And it allowed me to play at a high level. Mm-hmm. When I flipped to the business world, that's where I really struggled especially when I started working remote and I knew I could roll out of bed five minutes before I was technically supposed to be online, turn my computer on and I was there. Um, I found that my production throughout the day was absolutely terrible. I'd sit at my computer and just try to find motivation, try to find motivation. Um, and so I flipped that and I started waking up about five thirty six, Um, and I would use that morning time for me. So whether that was running anything physical, um, or even meditation. And I've actually found that they actually combined. When I go to the gym in the morning, that is my meditation time. That's when I let my, my brain run. Um, and, and the connection between kind of mind and body going into work that day after I've done that, my productivity skyrocketed through the roof. So you definitely hit on, on some very good stuff there, right there. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, how do you handle failure? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, um, I, I think, like you mentioned before, we're all going to run into this. And if you play sports in some way, shape, or form, you're you're failing pretty regularly. Um, whether it's uh, you know not hitting the or throwing the pitch you want, uh, you know going up there and striking out. But luckily, and I think we connect at the baseball level. Uh, batting 500 in those early days when you're when you're playing an 11 year old baseball is one out of two and that's, that's not so bad, but you're still failing one out of every two times. Um, it's the expectation of, of what's realistic uh, of what you're doing. And so as you go through different failures, I think you have to acknowledge what's real. So I think, I think me personally, and maybe a lot of people out there, we, we tend to kind of glance over them and not acknowledge them or, or what should be real out there. Because if we're not acknowledging them, we're just kind of glancing over them. And then that, that's the emotional part that builds up that, and in how you focus on it. if you're failing every time, if you think you're failing, it's kind of like glass half full, glass empty. That, that's not a good thing. But if you're coming back on, hey, I'm coming back next time. And I've already got the mindset that I'm going to get hit the ball next time. And as long as I get my one out of two for the day, I'm good. You, you're, you're setting yourself up for success, which I think then is the other piece of even if you are failing, start to look at your successes. Well, maybe I didn't get to the level I wanted to. Maybe I didn't go four for four today. But man, that two out of four times, I crushed the ball. I had line drives 90 miles an hour and they just happened to be right to somebody. We all have those days where it seems like everything goes right from all the training we do, from the habits we put together. But that's why we play the game. That's why right. we do No, that's awesome. And that kind of leads into the process over outcome aspect and the thought process that goes into that. If I'm only looking at the fact that I went 0 for 4 or 2 for 4 or 4 for 4 that day, it takes away from what I actually did. Did I hit the ball hard? Um, One thing that I learned in college was quality at bats, right? I may have struck out, but man, I saw I had an eight pitch at bat against the starter, which is going to help us get into the bullpen sooner on that. So in turn, that's a quality at bat, even though the outcome wasn't wasn't something that I wanted on that. And I think that's one thing. um, And we'll hop right into it with with the coaching aspect that the kids especially struggle with, right? Everyone wants the instant gratification. They want the instant success aspect of it. And so they're looking at the outcome instead of the process of what they're doing, right? How were my mechanics? How was my swing? Um, You know, if on the pitching side, did I stay back? Did I command the strike zone? For as a pitcher, once the ball leaves my hand, I can't control it. And vice versa on the hitting side, once I make contact, again, I can't control anything. Um, and, and one of the fun conversations that I have with these kids when they come in, um, I go, how, how was your weekend? Oh, it was great. I went four for four. And I was like, great. They'll like, walk me through these at bats. And it was like, oh, I got jammed on four, four fastballs, but I hit them over the third baseman's head. So I got four singles. And then I'll talk to another kid. And he's like, oh, I went four for four or oh for four. 
And I was like, well, what happened? He was like, well, I hit the ball hard every time, but it was right at someone. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's a success, especially when it comes to hitting in baseball, when you can fail seven out of 10 times and still be a hall of famer in professional baseball on that. And, And so I think for me, the biggest struggle is trying to get these kids to flip from the success or the outcome process and really focus in on on you and the processes that you're taking to get that success, because ultimately our success is almost out of our control when it comes to that. And I've had plenty of games where I've thrown great and given up four runs. And I'll talk to my dad after the game, like, "Ah, I pitched well, it's just kind of one of those days. And then on the flip of that, I may have struck out the side on 10 or 11 pitches and it looks great, but I knew that I missed every spot and they swung and missed on it. And again, it was one of those days and I can't control that. And that was probably one of the biggest hurdles, um, especially when I got to college and then professional baseball that I had to overcome was I can't control anything other than what I do over the mound. As long as I put myself in the best position to be able to throw a strike consistently and command the strike zone. And for me, it was down in the zone being a sinker slider guy. All of a sudden, the results aspect were taken out of it. And then by the kind of the end of the year, I'd I'd be right around the numbers that I wanted to be on that, which was kind of cool. Um, But there was a lot of trust in myself that that would happen, right? Because you'd go through stretches. And I, I know you've done this where you go 10 for 10 and then you go 0 for 10. And probably during that 10 for 10, you have a couple hard hit balls, but there's probably a little bit of luck in there as well. And on the flip side, you know, I'm sure if you go 0 for 10, you've hit the ball hard a couple of times and it's right at people and the frustration that builds up. But understanding and being able to break away from the outcome and just really focus on the process. And I think that's where the success comes from. It's funny you mentioned a lot of that because I think one of the things with the kids, uh, especially 11 years old, you're trying to get that point across to them. And, and letting them know that your coaches and those around you are seeing and watching and, and looking for different things. And so they've got success in their heads as, okay, I, I hit the ball and, and I got on base or, or whatever it might be, or I struck out the guy, but it becomes bigger than that. And I think there's a bigger aspect of the, the team aspect that they're, they're looking to accomplish. And, and when that kind of sinks in is, hey, coach saw that you hit that ball hard he knows next game, which we're going to play in another hour, that you're at the top of the batting order because you crushed that ball. He just went right into somebody's glove or he made a diving catch. You can't control that. So those right. little things that they don't think about, like, oh, okay, maybe, oh, that was a good thing. I didn't realize that. Like three little duck starts out in the field and there's a better pitcher coming in next game. I'm going, you might have went three for three against a guy throwing lollipops, but this guy's throwing you know, 75 miles an hour now. I, I need somebody who's swinging that bat well, which might have been something. No, I love that. And that's obviously why I wanted to get you on here, Um, especially for the kids to be able to hear that. I think that's a that's a huge learning curve and a learning lesson for them is it's it's not all about the results. Um, And I know how frustrating that can be, especially on the player side of it. Mm -hmm. But from the coaching side, we look at different things. I want to see how your mechanics are. I want to see how you command the zone. Uh, I've been like I said, I, I, I think there was an outing where I didn't get out of the first inning. And I gave up like eight runs, didn't walk anyone. And it was all, you know, singles or, or, you know, down the line doubles. But at the end of the day, I was like, man, I pitched well. And that's so frustrating. But when I came in, the coach was, hey, you did well. Or the day after we'd watch film and and my mechanics were good. I controlled the strikes. And it was just one of those days. And so you're going to have those uh, uber successful days where everything goes right. And then on the opposite, those uber, you know, terrible days where just everything goes wrong. And as athletes, especially, we want to kind of stay right in the middle of that and not ride that emotional roller coaster of up and down, especially when it's based off of the outcome. Um, I do know we talked about how you handle uh, failure um, and both business and coaching wise. How do you handle success? Uh, with success, I think, I think again, you, you number one, have to acknowledge it. You have to celebrate the successes. We do. Uh, there's one thing we do at my job now, and and I work with uh, you know a lot of elite individuals and uh, in Silicon Valley, and, and even the little successes, we look at them and we celebrate them as a team. Hey, uh, we did this for our customer. This they weren't expecting X, Y, and Z, or the, the product came across and it was broken. And, and when our product's broken, sometimes uh, you know these Fortune 100 companies aren't functioning or they can't do their job in security or patch these operating systems. When you guys hear about those 
those crazy virus outbreaks or somebody's hacked. So it's a pretty big deal. So for us to come in and, and make sure that, hey, we were under the gun and things weren't working as expected and we, we put everything into it and the little successes, we make sure we celebrate them and we make sure that, that as a team, we're all celebrating that because we're all, we're all putting in a lot of effort to, to get there. And, you know, the values that, that we come across with in our organization are, you know, this one uh, uh, really signifies most, like one team, one fight. That, that's really what we look for. You know, we, uh, you know, the, the, we win as a team um, and we're unstoppable. Uh, and we kind of bring that together. So, so that one team, one fight aspect of celebrating our successes, hey, if our buddies are succeeding, our teammates are succeeding, we're all succeeding. And I think that kind of leads into the way I coach a little bit, and especially in the team aspect, is the selfishly unselfish, right? You have to be selfish in what you do to be able to put the best product out there. And in doing so, you're going to give you know, the best self or the best you to your team through that. Um, and, and I love that combination because if I need to do a project and mine may be only 20 per, 25% of the final product, if I'm selfish and want to be the best 25% there is on that, and everyone has that mentality, that end product and that end goal is going to blow people out of the water on that. And, and I feel like that's a little bit away from what society is now, where it's it's got to be me and it's got to be the best product. But if it's integrated into the team aspect of that, man, I, I feel like it, the possibilities are endless when it comes to that. Yeah. If, you're, if you're successful, acknowledge it. Be successful. Just go with it sometimes. It's, it's the best way to do it. Oh, and it leads into what we talked, you know, the, the telescope goals and the microscope goals aspect, right? When you hit one of those microscope goals, celebrate, right? It may be even small. And I even still struggle with that right now, right? Trying to get the company off the ground, trying to do some stuff here. It's like, man, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And then I take a second to kind of reflect on where I started maybe a week ago or a month ago and see where I'm at now. It's like, oh, I've come a long way here. Now, I'm not where I want to be yet, but starting to celebrate those goals keep me motivated to get to where I want to get to on that. And there's been plenty of times that I failed throughout this. You know, a little bit behind on the website, a little bit behind on the mental ninja certificate aspect. And it's like, all right, that, that's fine. I'm going to get there. I'm close, I'm close, I'm close. But if I look, you know, two weeks ago, I didn't even have any of that up yet. You know, it was just maybe a quick idea or a conversation I had and then my brain ran on it. So being able to celebrate those little successes all the way through. Um, and that also leads into, I, I talk about a lot about how, where all the joy comes from and the joy is all in the process. And, and for me, being able to say that I, I was invited to big league camp and I got a pitch against these Uber big name uh, MLB stars. Now looking back, Back at that, now that I'm out of the game of baseball, that's where all the joy came from. It wasn't that I got to go to big league camp or I got to go to AAA or I got to play in, um, for me, it was the Arizona Diamondbacks big league stadium. Uh, that's all very cool. But man, the, the journey and the teammates that I had and the memories that I made throughout, that's honestly where all my joy comes from. Uh, and when I'm able to sit down and have those conversations, especially with teammates, it was never, oh, we won or we did this or I did that. Or It was always like, man, we got blown out. We went and had a great night together and made some good memories, forgot about it. We came out the next day and we went on you know, five-game win streak or whatever it may be. Um, and that's, that's the goal to try to get these kids to realize is all the joy comes from the process, the teammates you have, the coaches you have, and the struggles that you go through because that's what kind of builds the family aspect of that. When you're going through some failure, and you have a teammate or a coach that picks you up and allows you to have success after that. So that's awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, leading into our next question, I know you had a chance to look over the, the Mental Ninja program on that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And then that's going to lead us into which staple do you think is the most important one in there? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing looking at the Mental Ninja program was um, I wish I'd had something like this sooner. <laughs> right. I mentioned before, um, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't quite as, as, as the bad news bears, but it wasn't, you know, some, in some aspects too far off. Like there, there wasn't a focus. There wasn't a program like Diamond Club uh, and being able to have this and talking to you. So uh, I think everything it, it's putting together, it, it's building a lot of foundational blocks that are going to be immensely helpful as, as kids grow and they, they do bigger and better things or 
um, you know, whether it's in sports or whether it's professionally, these are key aspects that, that we should just know and be aware of and, and they help in whatever we're going to do in our lives. So um, I, I love what you put together and I love uh, breaking it down because sometimes as and we talk different terms, I think a lot of people have same terms, uh, you know, talk microscope, um, you know, telescope goals. I talk a lot of macro and micro when I, when I say the same thing. Um, so same idea. And, and, and so I love what you've been able to put together and, and really just break it down into understandable chunks that, that anybody from my 11 year olds to high school or college or, you know, anybody at that level can, can consume. That's basically why I wanted to create it. Right. Um, I didn't learn this stuff until college. Um, and honestly, it probably didn't even kick in until my fifth year when I was at Old Miss. Um, and that led me to have success in Pro Bowl, mm -hmm. right? I had failed for four years in college. And then the fifth year, I finally broke through. And for me, the biggest personal hurdle that I had to get over was I was afraid of success. Because I knew with success came a new expectation and a new level. And I was afraid of that. I was very comfortable just kind of being where I was and, and the expectations that came with that. Mm -hmm. And I knew that as soon as I did have success on that, that was going to be now the new norm. And then I had to do that every day and try to gain on that and go and go and go. And, and so even if the kids can't fully understand this yet, I want to give them an introduction to it, um, especially the breathing aspect. Um, the imagery aspect where they can handle right now and see themselves start to have success, even if physically it's not happening on the field. And like you said, it, it's sports, it's relationships, it's business, it's personal, whatever you want to do. Um, that's what I think that's why I'm so passionate about this is I can have the same mentality and mindset that I did in baseball in the outside world or the yeah. corporate world. And even when it comes to relationships, if I can give the best me that I can to you on that, whether that's a friendship, um, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, um, whatever it may be, I think that's where the disconnect can come from sometimes is I want to pull from you so much where if I flip that around and I can give you more back, I think that's how relationships and even personal ones grow on that. But I think the, the term I use for that is kind of the flow of everything around you and being able to slow it down because as, as you grow, if you don't have those foundational aspects in place that, that you can just rely upon and go, Hey, I know I can step up to the plate. I know I can swing the bat uh, and, and slow everything down for the level you're at. Then, then you're starting to be successful as you grow. And, and you realize like if, if certain aspects of, of whether it's emotional or physical, aren't ready for that, you need to step back and understand why, because you got to make sure that the flow of the game is not happening too fast because then it's not fun. And if it's not fun and you can't break down why, then you don't want to do it. And then, yeah, you're not able to move forward. And that, that makes it really tough. Uh, and you're 100% right. And that's how I, I started to handle failures. All right, cool. I may have failed today. Mm -hmm. Let's learn how I, what I do, what did I do wrong? What can I get better at here? So I'm more prepared the next time that I go out. And again, taking away the outcome aspect. And when I got into pro ball, I started watching a ton of video of just me, how I pitch, where the pitch location was on that. Um, and it turned from, oh, I gave up the single on that or, or, or whatever it may be to, I just asked my catcher, hey, was that a good pitcher? Yes or no? No. All right, cool. Then that's on me. Or if it was, yes, all right, cool. I'm in a good rhythm. I'm in a good flow. And then you can play the, the percentages aspect of it, right, and, and go from there. Um, and, and that's going to lead us right into our next question on this. How important is it for, one, to be able to understand your emotions, especially at the 11-year-old level? Mm -hmm. And then, two, how important is it to be able to control that? I think you can answer this a couple of ways. And in, in, in depending on age a little bit, and the reason I throw age in there is because younger kids are going to have more emotion. It's just natural. Right. Uh, and so it's not a bad thing. I think we, when you are doing something at an elite level or a high level, you're putting a lot of you into it. And so emotion comes with that. As much as we try to separate the two all the time, that's not always the case. <laughs> and so right. um, I think that's just one thing we have to realize. Everybody has to realize, but it's, it's first one recognizing it like, okay, this 
oh man, this is really eating me up or makes me angry or makes me want to cry. We need to be able to start to recognize that. And then two, if you do start to recognize that, then what do you do? Then how do you process that? And because as you get at more elite, higher levels, you know, you have to be able to process that to move on. There's always going to be that, that pitch you didn't make, that, that swing where you should have put one out of the park, but instead, you know, you got fooled on it. Um, so being able to do that is going to also set you up because if you're going to go back in the field or like at work, if something doesn't go right, I've got a call in 20 more minutes with, with somebody else or my boss. You can't let that run over, but you need to either know how to push that aside and worry about it later at the end of the day, at the end of the game, process it, and then come back and be ready for later. So they're, they're, they're intertwined, but you know, just, it's part of growing. No, absolutely. And I know I've worked with, with some of the kids. Um, and I think the coolest part is one of the kids that, that I have worked with, it, it was as soon as one thing went bad, it was just mm -hmm. out of it totally. Mm -hmm. Right. And then focusing on the why do I feel this way? I think it's probably the biggest question that, that I ask these kids. Hey, you may be sad today. That's fine. You're allowed to feel that way. But let's figure out why. And now when we figure out why, that gives us an opportunity to one, either be able to control it a little bit more, especially in a game setting or two afterwards, be able to, you know, all right, man, I really let my emotions get the best of me on that. I can't let that happen again. And now we can grow and build a better self um, for our team. And I, and I think that's a, an incredible thing. And for me, I mean, it, it made me cry when I heard about that. And I saw it firsthand out there when something went bad and all of a sudden it was a deep breath boom, lock back in and go. And I'll handle that later. I'm allowed to feel that way. And that's great. But I'll handle that in a second because I can't let my teammates down right now. And I think that's the kind of the selfishly unselfish of, hey, all right, I need to lock in for my teammates now. And then I'll take care of this after the game and we'll be able to go. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Maybe it's just your teammates razzing you later because, you know, you were ultimately successful, but it, that, that's what your teammates are there for. And they're able to help you process it too. So it's not just you either. Uh, and I want to speak on this right before we, we wrap up here uh, from the coaching aspect. Now, I lived it through the playing aspect, but I thought one, probably one of the coolest things throughout, whether it was high school, travel ball, uh, college or professional ball, a little bit harder on the professional level because guys move up and down so much. Um, how you have so many individuals from all over the world, especially in pro ball, um, come together and you become a family. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's probably one of the coolest things that sports allows on that is when you're having a bad day, um, having a teammate being able to pick you up and get you out of that mood and get you back um, and into that culture that you create on that. Hey, we don't act like that or we don't do that or we don't have that attitude. Go take five minutes, figure it out and come back and, and let's get ready to go on this. Um, so if you could speak on that at all, I know it's the 11 year old level, but I know you have a lot to do with that. Again, part of the reason why I wanted you on here. Um, but I think you got to be able to see it too, where a couple of your kids will be like, hey, come on, let's go or, or whatnot, and be able to pick up those other kids when they're struggling. Yeah, and that's it's amazing how that can ebb and flow and, and recognizing who those, those guys are who have it in them to, to make sure that happens. Uh, because you see it, especially at any level, you can see that as a coach, and just look and see like, uh oh, something's kind of taking control. One bad thing happened and it's kind of spreading. And you just you see it live and you can't like you can't move fast enough to slow it down. Uh, and that's where you have to that's that motivational aspect. And that's that's probably one of the biggest things I think probably coaches struggle with is when they see it, they need to understand one, which players can really step up and change that. Because you do, you just have certain players or certain guys who can come in and kind of command that, but they're also the same guys that can bring you down as well. Uh, so, you know, those teams that can operate at the, the highest levels and you know, score 20 runs and then come out the next game and score zero, it's, it's that little bit of ebb and flow. And uh, so recognizing it's number one, just you've got to be able to see it happening and know it's happening and, and know the guys that can kind of keep it going up and down or the little things that, um, uh, you know, if, if they have a bad inning or somebody makes an error, that it, if that's a thing that that brings the team down, we'll jump ahead of it, bring them in, and jump right on it, acknowledge it, and 
figure out what it's going to do to keep their heads up because that's the biggest thing. That's awesome. Uh, just to wrap up for anyone that's listening to this right now, uh, what are some words of advice for them? Um, I think a couple of things. I think when I talk to the kids or, or just even to go back to, to my team um, at work, you know, figure out what, what number one, you know, you're able to surround yourself with, with better people and figure out what makes you better and what you're able to give back. Uh, I think there's a lot of times we put ourselves around people who, who, uh, who take a lot, but I think as you grow and you get into the upper levels, you need to understand, A, you know, I want to be around people that make me better. I get around, I, I've got a, a great friend uh, who kind of taught me the art of hitting after I was kind of done with my college career, but played a lot of adult baseball, but he played double A and he opened up a hitting clinic and I helped him open it. And we would just sit there and talk and hit. And man, I just realized like he made me better. And at the same time, I was there for him to help him get the business going kind of at the same, kind of, kind of in the same vein of, and, and it was a good thing. We just made each other better. And I realized like just, even it was adult baseball, but I was still seeing guys throwing 85 miles an hour. I became a better hitter. I understood. I understood the art of hitting. Um, I think the other thing is is just figuring out what comes natural to you as a player, uh, as a person, and let it be natural. Just go rock it and, and let that be you. But also understand the things that you're not good at. If you're great, some of us are gifted physically and go. That wasn't me. I was I was I was, I was a smaller kid. So uh, there was a lot of other things I was able to, to bring. I wasn't the bigger guy, but man. Was a hell of a leadoff hitter, uh, and I got scrappy, and I go up there and take ten pitches, and I, I just get dirty and, and give everything I got, and it was my way of making up for for not being, uh, you know, the bigger guy on the team, and that was my role. So know what you do and, and do it well, uh, and then when you bring that, and know where you're not good, and then that's that's where you need to focus your efforts. So do do those two things, and uh, you know, you do what you want. I love that. Know your role and do it well. I knew my role. I was a sinker slider guy. I got a lot of ground balls. And if I wanted to throw harder, my, my ball would flatten out and I'd get hit harder. So it, it was always like you talked about the ebb and flow, right? There were days where I knew I felt really, really great and I wanted to throw as hard as I could. But my ball would flatten out and I'd get away from those ground balls. And it was crazy. The days that I felt terrible out on the mound were usually the days that I pitched better. Cause I stayed within myself. I, I knew what I needed to do that day. Um, and it's like we talked about earlier, you know, you can't be always at that hundred percent either max or success when you feel that way and vice versa, when you feel terrible. And so it's just trying to stay right into that middle, know your role, do it well and do it for your teammates on that. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Sean. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I'm sure I'm going to run into you soon and we can Thanks learn from each other. And obviously, man, go Bears. All right, go Bears. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Take care.